Lord Jesus, for your presence, Lord, that's in this house. God, we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you come to meet us, Lord Jesus. When we have a hungry heart, God, you said you would just come to meet us, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would do just that, Lord. I pray that you would use this word to encourage and to edify your body, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, for this vessel, Lord, that it's going to flow from, Lord. God, that you would anoint me, Lord Jesus. Anoint my words, Lord. Don't let them be my words, Lord. Let them be yours, Jesus. I pray that all the praise and the glory and honor could go to you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for how you're moving, Lord Jesus, in this earth. And I pray, God, that you would continue to do that. Lord, bless these people in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to change and use my phone because, like I said, I have a lot of reading to do. So I'm going to go to Esther 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even to Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and all his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glory and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days, and when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And I'm going to skip down to verse 9. Also Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Can you say that with me? Which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abatha, Zithar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore the king was very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Skip down to 15. I'm trying to set the stage for you here. <laughs> what shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but to all the princes and to all the people. Say that, all the princes and all the people that are in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad to all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded that Vashti be brought in before him, but she came not. So we're going to have a rebellion. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it not be altered that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate to another that is better than she. So the stage I want to set for you here is that King Ahasuerus has a mighty kingdom. And he's married to King Vashti. She is her queen. And Vashti is called in to do her duty, is to show her beauty before her king. But Vashti refuses the commandment of a king. I want you to hear that with a spiritual ear. She refuses the commandment of a king and does not go before him to show her beauty. <clears throat> now, what I want to relate that to is Romans 12 and verse 1, where it says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Right? Right? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That was Vashti's job that she didn't do, right? Okay, so 1 Peter 2 and 9 calls us a, royal genera a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should, what? Show forth the praises of him who hath called you, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why didn't Vashti come when the king called her? Vashti, let's see. Uh, let's go back to verse 15 through 19. Uh, Well, I lost it. Vashti said she was also having a feast with her friends. Sorry, y'all. Is it nine, you said? Yeah. No. All right, Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house that belonged to King Ahasuerus. So Vashti lived in the kingdom, so she was in the house, but she wanted to do her own thing. Okay, this is a type of religion. This is a type of old covenant, right, where she felt safe knowing that she was the queen. She felt safe knowing she was there. And it even says, Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to to the king Ahasuerus. You can be in the king's house and not be in the king's presence. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. So I'm going to turn over to Esther 2, and I'm going to start reading it 1 through 4. Like I said, it's a lot of reading, but there's a lot to draw out of it. All right, Esther 2 and 1. It says, After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done, and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things of purification be given them. I want to pause right here for a second and just note that Vashti's failure to perform her duty to the king did not end the king's kingdom. It did not decrease his wealth. It did not decrease his power. So I want you to hear that with a spiritual ear this morning. I'm going to keep going. Chapter 2, verse 4, it says, And let the maiden which please the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king to do so. I'm going to skip down to 7. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Hege, that Esther was brought unto the king's house, to the custody of Hege, the keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained, can you say that with me, obtained, kindness of him and he speedily gave her the things for purification which with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given to her out of the king's house and he preferred her and her maids to the best place of the house of the women and so what I want to bring out here is one the king's response to Vashti's failure was not failure also The king is still sovereign. The king still reigns when we have failed him, okay? And so what I wanted to bring out and what the Lord put in my spirit is are we having our own feast in his house? Are we doing our own thing? Do we have our own form of religion? Do we have our own form of godliness? Or are we coming to get into the presence of the king? Amen. So she obtained kindness from Hege, and that's something that the Lord just like blew up so big in my face. That word is obtained, not attained. You cannot come into the king's house and do works to receive grace. It is not something you can attain to. It is something that you have to obtain from him. But praise God, he said he gives freely. Amen? Praise God. So what I wanted to look at here, I'm going to skip down to um, verse 12. 
And it says, now when every maid's turn was come, wait a minute, I don't want to go there yet. Sorry. He, um, she, the maiden pleased Hege, and he, she obtained kindness of him, speedily gave her the things for purification. Okay, oh, I do want to go to verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months, according to the manner of women. For so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit, six months with the oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Okay, and I want to pause right there. She is purified with oil. We know that the oil is the Holy Ghost in the Word of God. So she becomes purified with the Holy Ghost. And she has a sweet odor about her now. And I want you to remember that sweet odor, okay? Because the word tells us that our praises go up as a sweet smelling savor into the nostrils of God. So now Esther is anointed with oil and she has a sweet smelling savor about her to go into the king. Thus, or 13, then thus came every maiden into the king and whatsoever she desired was given to her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, into the custody of Shashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came into the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and she were called by name. So what's happening is, after 12 months of purification, after they've just marinated in the Holy Spirit, and they smell of the fragrance of Jesus, he says, you're going to come into the king. And you're going to ask him what you will. And then you're going to go into this other house and wait. And if he delighted in you, he's going to call you by name. Okay, that's the scene that we're looking at here. It says, but now when the turn of Esther, this is 15, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come in to go to the king. She required nothing but what Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, appointed. And I want you to notice that because what did we say Hege gave to the women? The oil. So she was given the oil by Hege. So you can put in your mind that Hege represents a type of the Holy Spirit here because he's the giver of the oil. He's the giver of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So she said she required nothing except for what Hege gave her. She said, I don't need anything but your Holy Spirit to come before a king. I don't need gifts. I don't need sacrifices because those are artificial scents in the kingdom, those sacrifices, okay? And so Esther obtained favor. Where did I leave off? 15, 16. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the 10th month, which is the month Tabeth in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her the queen instead of Vashti. And so what I want to look at there is how they were called virgins. He said he loved her more than all the other virgins. And see, virgin represents purity. It represents Christianity. But since she had been marinating in the Holy Spirit, he preferred her. It wasn't just enough to put that name tag that says, hello, my name is a Christian. Because we meet those people all the time. Don't we out in the world, when you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, they say, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Easter and Christmas. Amen? There's something to getting into the presence of the Lord. And I know that that's the thing that he was wanting to do here this morning. And I'm telling you, this altar is not just a place to give your heart to the Lord. It is a place to come and to praise him. And I, you were just dancing all over what I wanted to say this morning. But something that just hit me so hard last week that I could not keep myself out of this altar. He said, offer to him the sacrifice of praise. And I think, where do you lay a sacrifice? You lay that on an altar. 
This altar is not just meant for me to agonize before God. I need you to answer here. I want you to do this for me. No, no, just like Esther said, I just want the thing that you've put into me, and I want to bring that back to you when it's my time to come out of the second house. I want to come, and I want to share with you the fragrance that you've put in me. I want to share the oil that you have put in me, church. Come on. And I think, I think of Abram, you know, he built an altar to praise his Lord. He didn't build an altar to say, save me from this. Help me with, he wanted to praise his king, church. I tell you, it is more of the will of God for you to interrupt a prayer service, to come to an altar to give him praise, than to stand back despondently with your arms folded and wait for the next portion of the service. I am confident in that statement that it is more of the will of God for you to get in, get into this pool. Maybe you're the one that's going to stir the water for somebody else to say, oh man, I'm coming too. Praise God. Don't be afraid. He's a gentle savior. He's a loving savior. And he wants communion with you. And he wants relationship with you. If you feel safe, For the fact that once a week you attend church and you go back out with the same problems and the same feelings that you had when you walked in here, I'm going to tell you to check your pulse because you need to be living for Jesus. Let that oil flow in you, church. When When something, anything, enters into the presence of the Holy Spirit in the presence of a most high king, it cannot go back the same. It's a physical impossibility. It is a spiritual impossibility. When something is brought before the presence of Christ, it has to change. Amen. Amen. Oh, I don't know where I left off. Esther. Praise God. Thank you. I think I wanted to to move on. You know, in in uh, Esther chapter 3, We know that um, Mordecai, he detects some treason. He lets the king know, you know, hey, these guys want to get you. And then he doesn't bow to Haman because Mordecai is one of God's people as well. And so he's not going to bow down to Haman uh, because he only bows down to the the most high God. Okay, so we're just going to kind of gloss over chapter three with that knowledge. Okay, and I'm going to move on to chapter four. Um. Pray for me, y'all. Amen. All right. So through correspondence, Esther is speaking to um, Mordecai. And Mordecai, you know, there was a a decree that went out through that that Mordecai not bowing to Haman. Haman says, all right, I'm going to talk the king into this decree. We're just going to kill all the Jews just to make sure we get Mordecai in there. Okay? So all of Esther's people and Esther herself stand to face death at this point, okay? Again, that hit me in the spirit, church, because I see all this garbage going on in our world with if it's not a virus, it's a riot. If it's not a riot, it's political junk. If it's not political junk, it's wear your mask at school. And I'm telling you, there is just this just cloud of darkness that's coming over us, okay? So I feel like in a sense, you know, the Lord is relating that to me through Esther here. So Esther has some correspondence with Mordecai, and he told her, do you think, this is Esther 4 and 13, if you need to pop that up there. I know I'm reading a whole lot, but there's just so much to glean out of this. I'll give you a few seconds to catch up with me. Oh, there we go. All right, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that you should escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. He's saying, hey, don't forget your Jewish too, sis. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there an enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth, and this is what I loved, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Think about your role in the kingdom right now. You are come into a kingdom for such a time as this, church. The Lord knew that coronavirus was coming. The Lord knew that unemployment was coming, that rioting was coming, that all of this unrest in our nation was coming. He knew this. And he still said, you're coming to a kingdom for such a time as this. And then she answered, 
Uh, then Esther bade them return to Mordecai with this answer. Go together, all the Jews that are in Shushan. Fast for me, don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and I will go into the king. And I want you to listen to this. I will go into the king, which is not according to the law, which is not religious, which is not pretentious, which is not my will. See, she would have saved herself because human beings are a little bit self-preserving, right? We save our own lives. But she says, and if I perish, I perish. She is saying, I am so desperate to get in front of a king that I don't care if this thing kills me. I have got to get into the presence of my king. So Mordecai went his way and did all that according to Esther, according to all that she had commanded him. And I just want to say this too. We can get so desperate to get in front of a king. But I'm going to tell you, you know your king. He is not about destroying his people. When you get so desperate that you want to get in front of your king because you want your people saved, you want the unity in the body of Christ, and not just in this church house alone, But when we call ourselves Christian across the land, across an earth, there should be a unity there. Amen? He said, if I, she said, if I perish, I perish. But she didn't. She made up in her mind to go into the king, whether he received her or not. And we know John 6 and 37 tells us, to him that cometh into me, I will in no wise cast out. He will not cast you out when you come unto him. When you're anointed with the oil and the fragrance, he cannot resist you. The Song of Solomon talks about how her, uh, her fragrance was sweeter than all the spices. When he smells you, he knows you, and he knows that is my love, and she is coming into my presence. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, Esther saw the destruction of her people was at hand. How many of us have loved ones that are not born again? How many of us have co-workers and colleagues that are not born again? Church, their salvation could depend, and I say does depend, heavily on you getting into the presence of the Holy Spirit. It depends heavily on you getting before a king and making a petition for them. Because right now, they're not in communication with the Lord. They're not going to mysteriously say, I need to be in the presence of a king. But I tell you, when that fragrance comes, because I'm just marinating in the Holy Spirit, I'm fragranced with the gifts. Because Esther didn't bring that herself. Those were not her oils. Those were the oils given to her to anoint her. And I'm telling you, what the Lord is letting us know is that you will be anointed to carry out the task that he has set before you. You cannot do it in yourself. If she would have exposed her flesh, she's a Jew and she wouldn't have been allowed in. If you expose your flesh, it will not be received. Hear what I'm telling you, church. Our flesh cannot do it. The oil of the Holy Ghost has to do it. The blood of Christ has to be seen in our lives because it's not our salvation to give. We obtained it. I didn't attain it. I didn't go through a 12-step program to become a born-again Christian. I went through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he sees that on my heart, and he says, my daughter is worthy. My daughter is worthy to enter into my presence. That golden scepter is out to me always, not just when I have a problem, but when I want to offer him praise, he says, come into my gates and offer that praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope you're hearing me today. It is the heart of Jesus to receive us unto himself. He doesn't want to share you with anyone. He doesn't want to share you with politics. He doesn't want to share you with your university. He doesn't want to share you with your workplace. Do you hear what I'm saying? He only wants you for himself. And that takes a consecration. That takes a life committed. Whether I die, I I die. Amen, church? 
I'm talking about, do you die to your pride? Do you die to your friends? Do you die to the wills of this life? Let those things die because you have victory. You're about to be crowned with a crown royal. And praise God, church, there's going to come a day where I'm going to be able to take that. I'm finally going to have something to give back to a king that has blessed me my whole life. Do you know what an honor that is to be able to say, finally, I have something to give to you for all of the glorious blessings you've given me throughout my life. Not one time has he failed, church. Not one time will he fail because it is not possible for a living Jesus to fail. It is not possible. So it's not that he just chooses not to fail you. He cannot fail you. It is not in his realm of ability. I praise God for that, church. I praise God to know that I have this anchor in my soul. And I wanted to address something that the Lord was talking to me about last week. Is I, I mentioned it about the sacrifice of praise because I've been pondering in my heart, Lord, why? Why can a Christian go down to an altar who is facing depression? And you mentioned it today, and I thought I was going to jump out of my skin. Mentions, we go down to an altar and we pray, God, alleviate me of this. I'm your child. And then we get up and we're the same. It might be in a week, it might be in a month, it might be in a year, and it happens to us again. Why can't we get the victory? And I know it's because we've turned those altars in a place of agony instead of a place of praise, church. And somebody had brought it up. I don't know if it was a fluke or what, but I, again, it was just some more confirmation. It was in Psalms. Psalms 43 and 5. Paul said, why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to his own soul here. Why are you cast down? Why are you disquieted or uneasy or tense within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Church, sometimes we have to make up in our own mind and we have to remind ourselves who we are in Christ. You anointed me to be queen. You anointed me with this oil. You found me, a person who was not worthy to even walk into a kingdom, and you anointed me. Am I going to let the fears of this life, the fears of an earth that we know ultimately is going to be destroyed, come between me and such a glorious Savior? Oh, soul, why are you disfitted in me? All right, why are you disquieted in me? Don't you know who's you, wh- whom you serve? And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to my own soul. Come on, soul. The Lord has died for me. The Lord has betrothed himself to me. I have the promise of his return. I should be excited just like when I was marrying Clint. I was excited during my engagement. I prepared my dress. I prepared the food. I prepared my make. I prepared, I beautified myself. But here's the glorious thing. You don't even have to beautify yourself. He sees, I, I know you're nothing but a lump of ashes and I'll give you beauty for it. It is all Jesus Christ, church. And if this doesn't make you encouraged, If this doesn't help you know that there is nothing more real than Jesus Christ. There is nothing more real than Jesus Christ. Praise God. Esther's confidence was in the fact that she was anointed. That's why she said, if I die, I die. I think there was something in her heart quickening her that she knew, I'm not going to. There's a chance, but I'm not going to because I'm full. I'm anointed. I have a holy fragrance that's going up to the Lord. I will tell you, if if you're caught in religion, if you're caught in just deeds and acts, the Lord tells you that he won't smell your sacrifice if it's all about you. I think it's an Amos. Let me try to look that up. Oh, I lost it now, but he just said, I, you know, I won't hear you. Look that up. Amen. 
I just, I just know and I'm so confident that if you can get into the presence of the Lord, and I'm, I'm not saying that the presence of the Lord is a church building because it is not. I want you to understand that with me, that just because I attend a, child, a church house where the presence of the Lord is allowed to move, it is not the same as moving inside of you. Can anybody hear that? You have to let the oil fill your vessel. You know, it's not, it's not the same as having the oil on the outside of my vessel. I want that oil flowing inside my vessel. And I'll tell you, there was a time I make a killer pot of chicken and dumplings. Amen. So for those yummy dumplings, you got to use some shortening. So there was this one time, it's a long time ago, I'm a really good cook now, but there was one time a long time ago I made this pot of chicken and dumplings, and I didn't know it, but my shortening went rancid. And whenever I made those dumplings, y'all, that first bite of chicken and dumpling, it didn't even have to have the dumpling in it. It was so nasty. It ruined the entire pot. And I want you to hear that. If you've had a one-time filling of the Holy Spirit, but he is not actively flowing through you, in and out, your oil can become rancid. And then it ruins the whole pot. Now, I want you to hear that with your spirit. If I'm not actively in the presence of God, and then letting that oil flow onto my people. Esther wanted to go and save her people. She wasn't just in it to save her own life. She wanted to save her people. I don't know about you, but I have some people I need saved because I know this time is so short. And he is looking for a bride who has prepared herself for his return. Let that oil flow in. Let that oil flow out and get back into his presence. This isn't a one-time thing. It's not a, and I, I did, it's not a journey to Mecca where you can cross it off your list and you're good to go. Hear that, church. Let this flow in and let this flow out. The Lord doesn't want to cast those out who are like Vashti. You may think, that's me. I've been a Vashti. I've sat here and I've not really absorbed the oil. I've not really absorbed the presence of my king. I will tell you that that is a part of Jesus' new covenant with you. It doesn't matter how long it's been since you've sat in the presence of God. He says, there's room for you. I have an infinite supply of that oil. Come let me anoint you. It may have been a period of time, but get in the flow. He says he's got waters that are ankle deep, they're knee deep, and then they get to waters we have to swim in. He is a never-ending supply, church, and it doesn't matter. He said it's not his heart to cast you out. It wasn't his heart to cast Esther out. He said, come, make your petition known whatever you want. I'll give it to you. Even on behalf of the kingdom, I'm going to give it to you. He's not just going to give you enough. He's going to give you the greatest measure that you could even contain. And still yet, it's going to overflow out of your life. That's redemption, church. Amen. And I'll tell you, the very thing that was meant to destroy Mordecai was the very thing that brought him victory. Think about that in your life. You might be going through some kind of trouble. You might be going through some kind of depression. You might be going through some kind of trouble. Uh, traumatic experience, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the type of savior that says, I am going to make beauty out of ashes in this circumstance as well. He said, the thing, you might go through a depression, but it's because you're going to be able to talk to somebody who's gone through it. And you're going to say, this is the hand that reached down for me and pulled me out. He's going to pull you out because he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't have just room for some bride. He said he has room for all of us, church. Get into the flow. There is nothing like this Jesus. There is nothing like this kingdom. I'll tell you, we know that the Lord said he created everything we know in six days. Everything we know. And if you believe that, believe this. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. 
I want to see the glory of a place that so far has taken 2,000 years to make because I find this world rather beautiful and it was made in six days. I'm talking about the glory that you had cannot wrap your heart around and it is still being prepared. It's still being worked on 2,020 years later. Church, he has a glory he is going to share with you. You will never hunger again. You will never sorrow again. You will never lack again in that kingdom that you're going to be a part of. Praise the living Savior.